call the uh, July 31st school committee meeting to order. Uh, nice to see everybody again. It's been a while. Uh, for tonight's agenda, we're going to move a few things around. The uh, we're going to start with the handbook uh, and then uh, do the uh, RYBS uh, presentation and then uh, other other routine matters. Uh, with regard to the uh, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the staffing request. We're going to uh, do that at our next meeting. Uh, just to get get some more information on that and uh, we do have an executive session tonight uh, also for our components of that are to vote on uh, uh, contracts uh, for various uh, unions uh, we will also postpone the uh, um, teachers portion of that to have the uh, full committee present for that I prefer to have that uh, so at our next meeting we'll we'll have the teachers component and the uh, <coughs> staffing request uh, everything else on the agenda is will be as uh, tonight mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, first off I'd like to uh, ask anyone that um, has any public comment for anything that's that's not on the None. Uh, I'd also uh, like to know if there's anything anyone would like to take off of the consent agenda. Okay. okay, then we'll move to approve the consent agenda as presented <coughs> in the packet. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? 5 0. Okay. Uh, John, we want to do the, uh, the handbook? Yeah, we can do the handbook. So um, annually, the school committee um, approves the high school handbook. Uh, so you've had the handbook in your in your packet. Actually, I think I sent it to you ahead of time so you could get some advance time to read it. Um, we also included a page of the changes, um, which Mr. Barker is here this evening. Be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, there weren't, as you could see, a lot of major changes to this year's handbook that you approved, similar to what you approved last year. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, as Dr. Doherty said, just to reiterate, really not major changes this year, sort of some tweaks um, to clarify some issues. Um, just as every year happens to be operationally, things will be just need clarification. Um, I can kind of go through each one, one by one. And then probably the area that many school districts are challenged with at the high school level is um, the issue around cell phone policy and, uh, and it's always one we're trying to teach the kids to be independent uh, while also still creating a, a, a non-disrupted school environment and, and so schools will kind of vacillate between you know, no cell phones whatsoever and then giving complete independence uh, so we try to find the happy medium uh, especially as a school that sort of prides itself as striving for BYOD and as a way to maintain cost and, and uh, you know just be mindful of the changes um, but to teach kids how to just be responsible users so I don't know the best way to go through it if you, if you want me to answer questions or I can go through it one by one it's up to you guys well, we, uh, actually have a, a motion first. oh yep mm -hmm. um, we'll move to approve the Reading Memorial High School student handbook for the 2017-2018 school year Discussion, questions for Mr. Barker? Oh, seeing none. All those in favor of the motion? 5 0. Thank you. Thank that you. was easy. <laughs> Is Erica here? I didn't see. Erica's here, yes. Oh. We're all and we're all set now and ready to okay. go. So um, before I get started, I just want to introduce uh, someone special and also um, I'm going to say goodbye to someone special. So um, I wanted to 
invite up um, Oscar Nemo and Oscar Lewis um, and let um, John say a few words about the process we um, have in place to um, change over our SRO position. And Lieutenant Abadi, who is their supervisor, if you want to come on up. Okay. And um, I'll just let them share a little bit before I get started. You want to say a little sure. Word? After we decided not to accept Officer Malulo's resignation. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, so Officer Malulo is moving to another uh, section of the department uh, in a promotion. Congratulations. Um, and we've been very fortunate over the years to have very strong school resource officers. And we, Lieutenant Abadi was our first school resource officer. And then we had uh, Sergeant Santaski, um, who is now uh, a night sergeant in the Marine Police Department. And now um, and so we went through uh, a hiring process. Um, it was a t uh, police school uh, collaboration. Um, we interviewed uh, five candidates, very strong candidates. Um, and I'm pleased to um, introduce to you this evening um, our new school resource officer, which starts actually tomorrow, right? Uh, right? Kind of tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was told anyway. Uh, Brian Lewis. Um, Brian has actually been on the force since February 2016. Prior to that, he was an officer with the Portsmouth, New Hampshire Police Department for seven years. He has a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice from the University of Lowell. So we'd like to welcome Brian officially to um, the position of school resource officer. Welcome. So, um, To the rank of detective, which is still in the same office that the school resource officer is in. So you'll be shadowing Brian probably for the next couple of months, at least until the middle of September into the school year. So you'll see the both of them around, um, still learning the ropes and filling some big shoes. That's about it. Great. Thank you all for that second just to put the name to the face. Appreciate it. Thank Congratulations, you. Mike. Thank you Welcome, Brian. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. <coughs> Excellent. And as you know, Officer Milo has done some amazing things in his tenure as SRO. For me, it's been fabulous having him as a partner and working on youth mental health first aid. Mike was one of our trainers. He helped us train over 600 people, put a lot of extra time and effort into that initiative. Having an officer in that role uh, as a mental health trainer was really powerful. He also assisted me with a training recently in Stoneham, and that was really powerful. That's his hometown. Um, and it was, it was great to be able to see his teaching skills come along. So thank you for all your hard work. Look forward to working with you in your new role. Absolutely. And um, we'll get started, I guess. Um, any, any other announcements? We're good? Okay. So I apologize that you didn't get your slides in advance, um, but this is part one of what we hope will be a couple presentations to start breaking down the data for you. There's a lot of data. There's 123 questions on the high school survey and then about um, <clears throat> a little bit over 80 on the middle school survey. So if you break that down, it's an enormous amount of data to kind of look at it from a lot of different angles. So tonight is really part one to look at some of the categories, give you some of the context, and then I'll come back and we'll do the second part and I'll be answering questions yeah. along the way. So this is 2017. We do the survey every other year. Um, Tonight we're going to look at school climate issues, behavioral health, and substance misuse. In part two, when I come back, um, when it fits into your schedule, we'll be doing physical activity, health in the body, violence and bullying, and auto safety. So just to give you a sense of the, the data partner roles, uh, we retain <clears throat> a consultant, Rothenbach Consulting, a PhD level um, person who's really um, well versed in doing these surveys. He does them for a lot of Massachusetts communities as well as folks all across the country. And he produced a really powerful um, data set for us this year. It's actually a web-based dashboard that's been really helpful for John and I. Um, and we'll be working through that. <clears throat> There's a lot of different ways we can see the data. Actually, more ways than more we've been, ways. been able to right. see the data, which is also why we're breaking it down into smaller parts for you. Um, we also um, work with the Reading Public Schools are the primary data collector. I work through the physical education department. And then also, um, I play the role as the survey coordinator across the district. Um, so just in general, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey started at the national level through the Centers for Disease Control in 1990. Um, it monitors health behaviors of students in grades 6 through 12. Not every district does the survey in grades 6 through 12, but you can participate in the survey. Um, Reading conducts a survey every two years. We do the odd years. 
<coughs> and our comparison represents thousands of surveys. So just to give you a sense of kind of how big the data set is from a national level, in 1991, 26 states participated. In 2015, 47 states participated. Um, it's about 15,624 students that have participated. It's a weighted sample. So they're pulling data to get it, come up with a demographic representation of students in the United States. Uh, in terms of state participation, um, about 96% of the states participate. It works out to an actual response rate of students at the high school and middle school level of about 60% of their sample participates. At the local level, we are lucky that about 80% of our sample participates. And I'll get into more detail about what that sample means and what the data pool looks like. Oh, so, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so that's the response rate at the high school level for the probability sample. Yes. <coughs> so the school response rate and the student response rate, um, we end up doing data cleaning, so you end up with a final response rate of what the actual usable data. So at the national level, because they're weighting the data, they might throw out a survey that's perfectly fine because it doesn't match up to their, their weighting requirements. Mm -hmm. So I'll get into more detail. When we do the survey in Reading, we're not doing a weighted survey um, because we're looking at the full sample, but we do do data cleaning, which throws out less of the sample, but still some of the sample. Mm -hmm. So a question I get a lot is, do students tell the truth on the survey? It's probably the most common question I get. It's a really great question. Um, especially if you've heard students talk about it. Some students are like, eh, you know, I don't, I don't tell the truth on that. Other students are like, eh, you know, I gotta take it anyway, I might as well do it. Now it's a voluntary survey, so it's all voluntary if students wanna take it. Parents can opt out their child. But when it comes to the actual data, what the research tells us is that the data of this nature that's gathered from adolescents is as credible as from adults using the same protocols. The internal reliability checks help us identify answers that are falsified. So there's a series of built-in checks that are within the survey. We ask questions a number of different ways. And then there's a data cleaning process that happens to remove the surveys that we know are inaccurate. And I'll get into a little bit more about that later. Um, in terms of reliability, there's a whole methodology behind the survey. It's quite detailed if you want to read it. It's about 96 pages. <laughs> um, but there is a science behind the process of the survey. We follow all the protocols that the CDC requires for collecting our data. Um, they have also done a lot of um, internal reliability checks in terms of wording of questions, which is why we stick with the way that they word questions because they've been tested. If we add a question, it's usually because there's something that we want to know on a local level. Um, and we, we think that data is important, but we also know there might be some, it's not perfect, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, we, we focus on trying to present the best protocol that we can to our students. All the uh, adults that are involved in the process sign a confidentiality statement. The data that's collected is anonymous. <coughs> <coughs> we want to make sure that students see, that as the teachers collect the surveys, that they're putting them right into an envelope. They're not looking at them. Not that they could tell what it meant, because it's just dots, bubbles. Um, but we want to make sure that the students understand that it's confidential. Um, the setting is within the physical education classes, both at the middle and high school level. And the high school survey is 123 questions. It can be completed in a class period. Um, and students were told their participation was voluntary. Um, they can also skip any question they want to. Some students might skip a whole section that they don't want to answer. Some students might skip every other question. It's up to them. They can do whatever they want. Does so if someone skips a section, the survey still valid? It depends. It depends on how much. If it's a huge category, it depends on what sections they've skipped. Um, but parts of the survey can still be usable. If they end up with about 85% of usable data on a survey, they usually will keep it in. It might get thrown out for other reasons, though. So this is our data pool. So the 80% is our local response rate. So it's much higher than the, the national, which is 60%. So it gives us a nice, strong data pool to draw from, which is great. God bless you. Um, we started with 1,265 students, which is what the enrollment population is at the high school. And then we, in a, we offered the survey um, to 1,054 students who wanted to take the survey, who participated. And then of that, 1,009 were included in the survey data pool. So there were 45 surveys that were excluded for data cleaning purposes. Any questions on that? Yes. Yeah. 
Oh, no, it's all set. All set. Thank you. All set? Mm -hmm. um, so just to give you a sense of how the sample breaks out across the grades, um, it's pretty accurate. Um, you know, different grades have larger student populations than others, um, but for the most part, it's pretty solid in terms of um, 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th grade participation. In terms of gender, um, it's pretty equally split. There's a little bit of a difference. You can see with female, male, and other response, we did include in the last two data cycles an option for young people to not assign gender if they chose not to. In terms of race, um, it's pretty reflective of what the demographic population of the high school is. If you look at the enrollment numbers, it's pretty <coughs> accurate. Um, in terms of, the, we're going to talk a lot about risk as we go through the presentation, but I want to bring to your attention, there are a lot of protective factors that we ask questions about as well in the survey. And some of the protective factors have a really strong rationale and a really strong research base behind them. And a couple of those um, that the Search Institute, which focuses on asset building, really focuses on for high school is the idea of adult support, constructive use of time, and commitment to learning. And those three areas you'll see reflected in some of the questions that we ask young people about stress and about their attachment to adults in school, things like that. So when we look at at least one trusted adult to talk to in the school, so we ask that question of, of young people, do you have someone in the, in the school that you can talk to? Um, we saw 78% responded yes to that, which is a huge improvement. Um, since 2007, we've seen that number go up and up and up, which is a testament to the work that um, the principal and all of his team is doing and across the district as well. I mean, you can see there that that's a protective factor. <coughs> it, within the home and community, ask the same question. It's about 89%. That tends to stay pretty even. The, uh, when I show you the middle school data, you'll see that that has jumped up a little bit, which is great news. But 89% of young people feel like they can go to someone in their family or someone in the community to talk about something they care about. Um, just a little bit around stress. There's different types of stress that we ask about. Within this survey, we ask specifically about negative stress um, because um, Assistant Superintendent Martin and Dr. Doherty were wanting to get a little bit more detail as to what were some of the stressors that were upsetting young people or creating challenges. And so we specifically went after that category. But I want to make sure we point out that not all stress is bad. <laughs> some stress can be good. And it really depends on what kind of supports that the young person has around them. So um, what we're trying to look at is prevent um, this idea of toxic stress. And I know Dr. Doherty has done some work on um, trying to prevent that across the district um, by creating more opportunities for young people to release that stress. Um, so some of the negative stressors that we asked young people about was, you know, just tell us what are the ones that, that are bothering you, basically. Um, and you can imagine most of them said their schoolwork, which makes sense, it's what they do every day. <laughs> um, some said they were too busy, um, worry about the future, school expectations, uh, family or personal challenges, lack of sleep, which is definitely something we see for sure, um, non-school activities, and, and then social. What I think interesting is I think a lot of people, <coughs> when we first asked the question, I think the adult's perspe perspective thought the social was going to be much higher on that uh, scale, and it really is not. You know, it really is the other pieces. Which makes sense, because if you think about just your day-to-day -day life as an adult, you know, the social piece is one aspect of it, and it is even more important in <coughs> adolescence. But it's the work that you do day-to-day -day that, that really is focusing your attention. It's the same for young people. Um, in terms of sources of school stress, we asked specifically what are the things that are, you know, creating some challenges within keeping up with your schoolwork. And so um, if you look at the ones that are the biggest, starting from the bottom, um, studying hard things, workload, teacher expectations, which is a positive and a, and a negative sometimes. It really depends. The expectation isn't a bad thing necessarily. It's a challenge if a young person feels like they don't know how to meet the expectation or they're confused about how to get there. Um, getting up in the AM, I can testify to that one with two teenagers at home. Um, lack of interest, um, going to school, the long day aspect, you know, getting up, having a long day, and then the pressure of study. But overall, um, you know, when you look at the bottom, um, that's about what you would expect when their day-to-day -day life is focused on getting their work done. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty similar from 2015 <coughs> to 2017. Um, we've been only asking this set of questions for the last two data cycles, so we don't have a huge um, longitudinal look at it yet. Um, Pat, yep. Um, so 
interesting that um, study hard things, and I see that's a stress, but I almost also see, I mean, we're challenging students. We strive to challenge students and have rigor in the curriculum. We have to, you know, balance that, obviously. So. Um, yeah, and again, not yeah. necessarily a bad thing, but right. one of the, the things that I'm just gonna flip back to the protective factor slide. If you look at um, what, where they say the commitment to learning, the two pieces that are considered protective are motivated to do well in school and actively engaged in learning. So it could be something that is rigorous, but if they're fully engaged and they're jazzed about it, it's gonna feel less stressful. Mm -hmm. If it's an area that they feel less connected to, then it might create more stress. So it's not necessarily a positive or a negative, it's mm -hmm. just perception, basically. Right. And so you'd have to kind of look individually at classes and levels to kind of figure out some of that. But it gives you an idea sometimes of how young people might perceive something. Extracurricular activities, we ask young people to just check off all the extracurriculars that they're involved in just to get a sense of, we know there's so much going on within the school setting as well as after school and then outside of school in the community. Um, you can see that at least 58% participate in at least one sc school sport. I believe the number is something like almost 90% participate. Yeah. Uh, but again, people just checked off what they checked off. Uh, about 40% reported having some kind of part-time job. 33% were involved in some kind of outside activity like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, club team, um, AAU, figure skating, um, school club involvement, community service activity, school band drama, um, dance, gymnastics, karate, kickboxing, and then religious services. So a wide range of activity involvement. And they, obviously they could be participating in more than one thing. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of sleep, we started um, looking at this as a really important thing for our district in the past two years or so, mm -hmm. um, and starting to look at should there be a later start for school time. Because a lot of the new data is saying that for adolescents, the way that their, their kind of sleep table works, that they do need a little bit more sleep, and it's hard for their body clock um, to get to bed on an earlier cycle. Um, so some of these questions kind of tie into that whole rationale. But the other thing that I think is interesting mm -hmm. is They've done studies to say that insufficient sleep is actually associated with higher odds of substance use, unsafe sexual activity, um, auto accidents, obesity, physical activity, um, all kinds of things that you may not think about insufficient sleep. Because it, when the brain is tired, it might do a riskier thing. Um, also, the recommendation yeah. is that teens should get eight to 10 hours of sleep per night. Oh, sorry. Where did they get that data? This data? The data regarding all the things that insufficient sleep. Care. That is a YRBS study. So it, they took YRBS data, cross-tabbed it, and then it was an outside um, research study that looked at the samples. So they were able to draw and, dis and kind of look at if you had five hours of sleep and you also might have reported higher amounts of substance abuse. So that's kind of, from my reading of the study, that's what my understanding is. But the link is on the, on the slide if you're interested. Interesting stuff to kind of think about. <clears throat> Um, but the recommendation is for <laughs> eight to 10 hours of sleep. And um, we, we know that only about 27% of students are getting that eight to 10 hours. So that's, that's not a lot. So if you look at where we are right now, um, only about 24% in 2015 got eight plus hours of sleep <clears throat> of our high school students. In 2017, it was 22%. And you can see that it kind of, um, the most kids are getting the seven hours. So we'd love to see them pick up that extra hour to kind of make it a little bit better for their brains and their bodies. One of the interesting things is the older they get, the less sleep they get. <laughs> so if you look at the data of the freshmen versus the seniors, 29% of freshmen got eight plus hours of sleep compared to only 19% of juniors. So that you lose an hour as you get older. Um, and if you look at the middle school numbers, I think the middle school, we'll get to that slide in a little bit, is over 70% get eight plus hours of sleep compared to 20 2%. I, I feel like if you surveyed this room, we'd be on the far right <laughs> or below. I know, I know. That most definitely. Yeah, yeah. And it may not seem like a lot an hour difference, but it is. if you look at the National Sleep Foundation studies, which are different than the YRBS studies, they do show that there is some research around driving and just that one less hour having an impact on your ability to concentrate, et cetera. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, you're going to get to it, but the any correlations between sort of the screen time and the, the tube time. I think that's a, you know, looking at some of the, the 
information on this, it seems like that's one of the biggest factors um, in terms of even the not only the hours of sleep, but just the quality of the sleep. Right. Um, when that's what they're doing, you know, for the two hours before bed. Right. And the other thing that, that I don't think our society had 10 years ago was people sleeping with their phones. So people are sleeping with their phones. A lot of teens are sleeping with their phones right next to their head. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just the fact that they might have been on the phone, it's that the Snapchat's going off all night. And that ding, 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 ding is going off all night. Um, the group chat goes off all night, you know. So it, it creates a lot of stimulation for the brain, so the brain can't really get into REM sleep. So I know that some of the local providers, um, we've talked to them about a lot of different issues, but one of the ones they've talked about is trying to do more on sleep hygiene because it is a challenge. Erica, I, just yeah, go I, would, I would just add that when we talk to kids, especially students who are struggling, you know, they'll report just the, the amount of time it takes them to complete work and, and acknowledge that a large part of it is the distraction of constantly checking to see you know, who just texted me and who just posted what and, and trying to work collaboratively with parents and, and helping and really with the kids at that age to help them kind of decide what, what are they capable of doing independently and, and what do they need some help with. And it's become harder to monitor, too, from the parent side, you know, you may take the phone away while they're doing homework, but then they say, oh, but I need my phone for homework because my calculator's on it, or I got to look up my thing on, uh, on the portal. And they're right, that they do have to use some of that stuff. And so there's this fine line between, like, do they really need it or do they not need it? So it, it's hard monitoring as well as it is for the kids to self-monitor, for sure. The other thing that comes up is the emotional response to some of the things that might be coming up on a Snapchat or an Instagram. So they may be perfectly fine and then someone posts something that's upsetting. It's not just taking them out of their schoolwork, but it's also creating an emotional response. Um, in terms of concussion, this is a new set, of, a new question. This hasn't been on the survey before. Um, but we did want to point out that given that many states now have a concussion law or legislation that requires um, states to do education as well as to monitor concussion, they felt it was important to create a data set. So um, about 84% had no concussions. That's what they reported as having zero concussion. 11% reported one concussion, 3% um, two concussions, 1% uh, three concussions, and then 1% four or more concussions. So we don't really know what it means yet because we don't have anything to compare it to yet. The national data doesn't come out um, for another year. So, and they did not ask this question in the previous survey, so we have nothing to compare it to yet. So this is just a baseline for us. But it, is, it will be helpful have, to have go, moving forward. Do, do we have data within our, uh, within our uh, athletic department to compare to, to this or historical? No, what is reported to us by the families? Mm -hmm. If they don't report it to us, we, we don't know. So this is capturing concussions that might not happen at one of our events. Right, it could happen at their outside karate activity, right. it could happen anywhere, mm -hmm. yeah. And this is youth self-report saying that they have had a concussion. They may actually have a higher rate of concussion if they don't perceive that they've had a concussion, even though they might have had a concussion. Right. Some kids aren't comfortable with getting the diagnosis of having a concussion because it takes them out of play. Right. You know, so it's tricky. It's tricky, for sure. But again, this is just one piece. I know that Mr. Zay couldn't be here tonight, but this is an area that he, he's looking forward to having some data to kind of look at. Um, but we also know that um, the concussions are happening in other activities that the kids are in outside of the school setting as well. In terms of behavioral health, we ask a series of questions that focus on measuring depressive indicators, suicidal ideation, um, and the reason for that obviously is the, the, the risk factors that go with those behaviors, but we also want to have a sense of, you know, what are the underlying factors, which is why we ask some of the stress questions, it's why we ask some of the questions about sleep, um, so, so we can get a better context of what's going on with young people. So if we look at our depression numbers, this is all Reading data going back to 2005. You can see that um, right now in 2017, about a quarter of students reported feeling sad or hopeless for two or more weeks in a row to the point where they felt like they couldn't um, engage in their usual activities. Does that mean they have depression? No. Does that mean that they may have a symptom of depression? Yes. So it's important to kind of understand that's just one tiny piece of how young people are perceiving what's going on. But you can see it did go down a little bit. Um, 
But going back to 2005, it was still 22%. So we tend to see it kind of stay pretty steady. Non-suicidal self-injury. These are behaviors where a young person might self-harm um, to control a feeling or to numb out something. And that is at 16%. Um, it's dropped from 2015, which was at 22%. Um, we've seen an increase in the number of young people who have been referred to treatment for that, which is really positive. <coughs> in terms of suicide risk, there are three, actually four questions that we ask. The first is, have you ever seriously considered suicide, which is an indicator of planning? Then we ask a question about, have you ever made a plan to take your life? <coughs> and then the third question is, have you actually <coughs> attempted suicide? And the follow-up question is, if you attempted suicide, did it result in an injury that required medical attention? So if we look at the three categories, what we see is uh, for Reading, um, about 7% ultimately made an attempt. Half of that required medical attention. The, the attempt was serious enough that it required medical attention, so about 3.5%. If you look at planning, um, you can see it's a little bit higher than the actual attempts, which is why we take it so seriously. And then if you look at seriously considered, it's higher than the planning, but it's not as much as the actual attempts, but we take every comment that a young person makes very seriously. And the high school's done a really fabulous job at, I keep turning to, to Mr. Barker because he's right here, um, of utilizing our crisis stabilization services, our mobile crisis unit, our interface referral service, which we'll talk a little bit more about as, uh, towards the end. But there's a lot of supportive services that have been able to address some of those ideation failings as well as the ongoing work of the clinicians within the school. Um, in terms of comparison to other data sets, you look at the United States data set, which is that 15,000 students, that weighted sample, as well as the state. Um, the data is two years behind because they don't release their data as quickly as we get the local data, but this is what we have, so we're gonna share that. Um, you can see that the US rate for seriously considered is a little bit higher, state rate's a little bit higher, um, and if you go down the line, it's, it's you know, a little up and down, but what's interesting is if you look at um, actual attempted that result in an injury, it's 3% across the board. So there might be variations, but we can pretty much count on that there's a 3%, um, usually under 4% that will actually make an attempt. That's why it's so critical that we take seriously any conversation or notions that young people have around this issue. Any questions on that? Uh, behavioral health treatment, we ask young people, are they taking medicine or receiving treatment from a doctor or other health professional for any type of behavioral health, mental health condition or emotional problem, just to get a sense of who's already engaged in treatment. And about 21% have reported in 2017 being engaged in some kind of treatment. And that's the same as 2015. And it's a little bit higher than it was in 2013 when we first started asking that question. Um, we started um, asking this question in 2015. I think this is one of um, Craig's suggestions around distraction due to physical, mental, or emotional problems. We, we do sometimes have young people who can't focus or concentrate on their work because they're distracted by their symptoms. So this question kind of gets at that. Um, so we had about 20% say that they had that experience, but about 11% aren't sure. So it's interesting that you know, they, they may feel a little bit on the fence about it. So we might wanna kind of fine tune this question. This isn't one of the national questions, so we're kind of learning as we go. Mm -hmm. um, nicotine misuse. I know that we've talked a lot about nicotine, come before you many times to talk about the, the seriousness of nicotine. But I think one of the important things is that the research says that there's no safe exposure to nicotine in adolescents, um, particularly because of the issue with leading to addiction. Um, but also because smokers or people who use tobacco are more likely to drink alcohol, use other drugs, uh, engage in other types of risky behaviors. So like sleep, it's interesting that the nicotine actually increases the level of other risk behaviors. Um, so if we look at cigarette use, um, it, the rate has been declining over the last 20 years. We've done a, a great job as a nation around a lot of controls around cigarettes. And that has led to some decline. Um, we can see that the U.S. rate from 2005, it went from 27% down to 11% in 2015. For Reading, we're down to 8% current cigarette use and 13% lifetime, meaning they ever tried smoking. 
you can see the national rate is still at 38%. If you look at other tobacco use, um, those rates have declined, um, not as much. We see a little bit of a differentiation. Part of that is we've seen a lot of these new tobacco products that have come on the market, skinny cigars, flavored cigars, um, cigarillos, which are very popular, and those flavored products have kind of sustained the, the cigar market. If we look at vape use, which is electronic uh, cigarettes or e-vapor products, e-hookahs, um, they look like little pens that have a liquid um, that contains nicotine or another substance, and that rate has been going up. Um, if you look at, we've only started asking this question since 2015, so we don't have a lot of data kind of to look at, but we know that it's much higher than the cigarette, um, the cigar smoking and the um, smokeless tobacco use. So in 2017, 27% reported current use and 36% reported ever trying it. And um, that's a little bit lower than the national rate, but it's definitely concerning. It's a lot of young people who are trying. Um, alcohol misuse. Um, underage drinking obviously is a concern that we have for lots of reasons. One of the biggest reasons is the um, contributing factors to motor vehicle crashes, to unintentional injuries like falls and drownings which you'd be surprised are still one of the primary reasons how young people get really hurt is um, being drunk and doing something while they're drunk. <laughs> um, that is really where a lot of the injury happens. So we see young people who are out in the cold or we see young people who pass out and may have alcohol poisoning or get behind the wheel. Um, the other piece that's concerning is the risky sexual activity that can happen as well as academic problems over time. Um, and we also know that if young people start drinking before the age of 15, they're six times more likely to become dependent on alcohol. So the longer we can get the brain to stay alcohol free, the better the brain develops. So if we look at our rates, luckily, the work that we've been doing has been making an impact. Um, and I, when I mean the work we're doing, I mean as a community. It's a lot of different strategies that are, we're working on, from the work that the Board of Selectmen is doing, to the work that the high school is doing in policy, the work the school committee has done in terms of policy, as well as all the prevention efforts um, that our police officers have been doing, you can see that the rates have gone down over time. And um, this is our high school rates of uh, students that have ever drank alcohol. There's another view here. So for Reading, um, we're kind of the tealish one. We're at 36% for young people who are current, report being current drinkers in the past 30 days. and. Um, that's much lower than we started in 2005 at 45%. So that's, that's nice. We're still seeing that downward spiral there. But, yep. but it's higher than the state and the It's higher than 2015. Let me go back. Yeah. That one. Um, it's higher than 2015, yeah. Nope, it's lower. So we're 36% now. Yeah, 38. We were 38 in 2015, so we've gone down 2%. Right, and but I think Gary's pointing out that it's higher than what the state and, and uh, U.S. was in 2015, which was 34 and 33, is that correct? Yes, it's, it's a little bit higher. We've always been higher, uh -huh. um, so, but we are going down. So yes, we are still a little bit higher. We haven't seen the 2017 mm -hmm. rates, but we do anticipate from the early data that we're seeing that th their rates will be about 2 or 3% lower. So we'll still be higher than the state of the national rate. Yes. So you just said we've always been, do we know why? Um, well, there's a, a lot of factors, but um, suburban communities tend to have higher rates of underage drinking. Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot of cultural reasons, a lot of um, history around underage drinking, rites of passage, things like that. Um, but there is a lot of research. If you look at a lot of the suburban communities with their YRBS data, they, their <coughs> underage drinking rates tend to be higher um, by up to 5%. We're gonna be comparing our data with um, our Mystic Valley Coalition partners, as well as the regional YRBS that we're gonna be part yes. of, which is another 15 communities. And that'll be the first time we'll be able to really see specifically. There's a lot of data that's much more like the weighted samples that the, nation, the national sample is. Um, but we'll be able to see individual uh, data for the first time in the next like year or so. So it's gonna be interesting to kind of see how it all shakes out. But I looked at some of my colleagues' data from six other towns, and they're about where we are. Um, binge drinking, um, this is another one that's always been a couple percent higher. 
but we've made significant strides. We started at 29% in 2005, and we're down to 20% for binge drinking. And you can see some of the uh, major policy changes that happen, the liquor policy and the highway safety um, grant compliance checks that our officers are doing, as well as the school chemical health policy, the zero tolerance policy that our police officers have implemented, the diversion program. All of that happening over time has, has helped to contribute to a, to a decline. Um, in terms of drug misuse, a lot of different categories for drugs, but the major ones that we focus on are marijuana, cocaine, inhalants, um, hallucinogens, um, injected drugs, ecstasy, um, prescription pain meds that are used without a doctor's order, as well as um, looking at um, if they used it on school property as well. We also know that synthetic marijuana use has been increasing. So our marijuana rates have stayed, they've declined a little bit, or they've stayed about the same, but we've seen an increase in synthetic marijuana rates. So we know that marijuana as a whole is going up um, because synthetic marijuana as a category and availability of synthetic marijuana has expanded. So that's things like K2 spice, things that you can actually buy. Um, they're sold as um, what's the best? potpourri products. Um, so you can actually buy them on the internet, you can get them in stores, um, and they're sold not for human consumption, but people do smoke and use them. Um, the, re the research for synthetic marijuana is still developing. It's a very relatively new product in the last five years, but they've been seeing issues with nausea, vomiting, chest pain, hallucinogens, uh, hallucinations, I'm sorry, agitation, and acute kidney injury. So the kidney injury, really critical one to just make sure we point out to folks because that's something we've seen in the last year or so. Um, lifetime substance use, these are the top four substances that we, we see in terms of the most young people using them. So alcohol, obviously, uh, followed by marijuana, the e-vaping that we talked about, and then cigarette use. So nicotine, marijuana, alcohol, basically are the ones that um, most young people are using, which can lead to other use, and that's the challenge that we have. Um, current substance use, looking at a little bit differently. Um, cigar use is still pretty prevalent in the past 30 days. Um, Binge drinking is a concern, but it is going down. You can see the marijuana rates have declined a little bit, but again, we still have another question that asked about synthetic marijuana, mm -hmm. so it's not really a decline. Um, and then alcohol has gone down a little bit. Um, in terms of Rx misuse, so young people are asked a question, have you misused a prescription drug to get high without a doctor's order? So not that they just took a medication, but they used it to get high. Um, we can see that the rates are pretty low, but they're definitely concerning. Um, the dark blue is tranquilizers, the middle is stimulants, and then the, um, the greenish, bluish is the pain relievers. So the pain relievers are things like oxycodone, uh, Percocet, stimulants are things like Adderall and Ritalin, and tranquilizers are like benzodiazepines. And we are seeing um, an increase in benzo use, particularly. Um, but you can see they're still relatively low, but concerning. What, what? Would you say what's benzo? Tranquilizer. So it's you know basically settling the body down is the reason people use it. Um, what we see is a, lot, a combination of these three substances. So people will use the pain reliever to kind of get the downward feeling, the stimulant to get back up, and the tranquilizer to level up. So we see a lot of poly use. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people become their own pharmacist of trying to figure out how to balance their mood throughout the day. Um, and we've seen an increase in young people misusing um, Adderall and Ritalin, maybe taking it from other people that have legally prescribed those medications. Um, and some of you attended the movie we did last year, which focused on that particular issue. Um, lifetime substance use for all the substances. Um, and I, I, I kind of made the scale 100% because I wanted to be sure that folks understand um, that the rates are relatively low overall. But it is important to know that there's still concern. If we look at inhalants, which are easily found in any home, they can be any household product. Um, cocaine has gone down, but still a concern. Hallucinogens like LSD. Heroin, we know why heroin is a concern. Uh, methamphetamine has stayed pretty steady. Uh, Non-prescribed steroids. And then we ask the question, have you injected any illegal drugs, which usually means steroids or heroin. Mm -hmm. And you can see that's 3%. Um, perception of risk and harm. This set of questions, oh, sorry. Can, Can we go back? Yeah. 
Yeah, on that slide, did you have data on opioids? That Does that mean that they were below 3% or they just weren't part of the data? Um, heroin is an opioid, and then the other opioids are in the Rx misuse. So the pain relievers are the opioids. So it's only captured that you combine it with the heroin data on the next slide? No, nope, they're separate. They're separate? They're separate. Okay. Yep. So 4% used some type, uh, not all pain relievers are opioids. Right. Um, so we don't ask a question about opioids because young people tend to know what they use, but they don't call it necessarily an opioid. Um, but so we look at the pain reliever as the majority of pain relievers are opioids, not all of them. And then we've got heroin is the opiate. Yeah. So you would add the two together. They're, but they could be using both, same person could be using both. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, perception of risk and harm, these are questions that our funders ask us to ask at the national level for our Drug Free Communities Project. Um, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, says that these questions actually um, create an opportunity to look at what are young people's perceptions, because those perceptions can sometimes be an indicator of actual behavior. The research is still developing and expanding, but there is some correlation and some causation studies that say that if your perception of risk is higher, your perception of harm is higher, then you're less likely to engage in those behaviors. So if you look at young people who perceive their parents to disapprove of specific types of substance use, we ask four areas, smoking, drinking, marijuana use, and Rx drug use. Um, you can see that the parental disapproval rates, their perception of that their parents would disapprove were pretty high. So 95% for smoking, a little bit less for drinking, but the question is daily drinking, not just any drinking, so it's important to no notice that. Uh, marijuana use, and then Rx misuse. On that. The question is, do you think your parents would disapprove of you engaging in these behaviors or yes. did they approve of themselves engaging in it? The question asks if the, if the parent would disapprove of them engaging in it, yep. And then the next area is peer disapproval. So same line of questioning but asking would your peer disapprove of you using <coughs> something? And um, those rates are a little bit lower, which we would expect. Um, but still pretty high. Um, you can see the middle two uh, for alcohol and marijuana are, are much lower, so that's an area to look at. Um, but in terms of cigarette use or smoking and Rx use, those rates are pretty high for peer disapproval. Risk of harm, um, you can see that smoking is pretty high, Rx drug use is pretty high, regular marijuana use is pretty low. And that definitely is something that has been impacted by what's happened at the state level. and. Um, the decrease in harm perception that is happening because of the change in law. I think all of, if you go back through all those slides, all of the marijuana are concerning, and I think that part of the problems in capital, you know, the state house, you yes. know, uh, yeah. and uh, they're not helping us. Nope, you know. definitely not. Just, I think just being on the. Um, you know, serving on the CASA board, this is, I think, one of the issues that we really struggle with because uh, it's such an important area for, I think, parents to recognize that it, it is, it, it's, a, it's a start, it's an opening, and the risk of harm, the, it just really has always bothered me, and I keep trying to remember if this 86%, this perception that students feel um, that, you know, 86% felt that their parents would think this was wrong, and that, that should be in the mid 90s or, you know, because if you, the kids who, who start using marijuana, they think they're doing okay with it. They're not, they don't, they don't recognize over time the impact. And I, I just think, I saw, I've seen it as my kids have gone off to college. If this is, you know, people who are thinking this is okay, you know, we can, again, you go back to when there was a back parking lot here. Um, and it's not the same, and you're making a critical error if you're not commuting, communicating to your kids as strongly about use of marijuana as you are about alcohol and smoking. Um, it, it just it puts them in the wrong pathway. It, the you know addiction rates are higher. The impacts people aren't connecting it because the behavior or the the symptom, the things that start to go wrong take a longer time. Yeah, it's a much more of a slow build for things to start falling apart. 
what we tend to see is the average high school marijuana user, things don't really fall fully apart until college. And that's a bad time for things to fall apart <laughs> because they've worked really hard to get there. And the ongoing marijuana use, which maybe was in high school two or three times a week, becomes daily use, and you start to see a build. The other thing that we've seen, which has really shifted marijuana use, and I know that the officers could probably speak better to this than I can, is, is vapes. We, you know, the amount of marijuana that you could vape in a day <laughs> is enormous because if you use something like a, a cannabinoid oil or a thing called earwax, which is mm -hmm. a concentrated form of marijuana, you're getting a high potency, much higher than you would get in a joint or a blunt, um, so they're getting much more. Even from a nicotine perspective, if you're vaping, one cartridge is a pack of cigarettes, and they're this big. So just from like a quantity perspective, this is nothing. If I put that in my vape, it's nothing. So if I put that much marijuana in my vape, I'm not gonna think it's much either, but it may pack a really strong punch. And I know that's some of the thing that you've, you've seen. I don't know if you wanna say anything about that. <coughs> yeah, it's just that it's, it's kind of an unknown misconception you know, that, that the kids think that you know, it's, it's safer to vape, it's not cigarettes. Not harmful, but now studies are coming out that you know it's creating popcorn and lung and, and all these other things that we don't see and we don't see in emphysema patients that are usually in their 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, but the amount of THC that they're taking into their body and the amount of nicotine that they're taking into their body um, is so great in comparison to the amount of product that they're actually consuming. Um, so that that ratio is just so much greater than it used to be. Uh, even the marijuana, you put the raw marijuana. In And despite the changes in state law, it's still illegal for kids under 21 to use marijuana, so it's important that we continue to get that message out because some young people have misperceived the, uh, what has happened at the state level as being permission to use. So it's really important that we educate them because of the brain development. The research on brain development for marijuana is very similar to the research on brain development for alcohol, that it increases their risk for dependence. Um, the other thing we're seeing with vape use, which is really interesting, is because they're vaping nicotine at stronger levels, you know, pack of cigarettes and a tiny little cartridge, if they're also vaping marijuana, they're vaping more marijuana to counter effect, counter, uh, uh, I can't say the word. Counteract. Counteract, thank you. Um, the effect of the nicotine, because the nicotine brings them up, but they want the marijuana to bring them down. So they're actually using more marijuana to come down because they've used too much nicotine. <laughs> so we tend to see much higher rates of nicotine use from kids who are marijuana users. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of interesting mm -hmm. uh, to see just the change in the product how that contributes to use and the increase in the amount of um, substance that's going into their bodies. In terms of alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention that happens at the high school level, we have two classes, the ninth grade class and the 11th grade class. Um, it's been pretty steady for the last three data cycles, 88% report getting the ATOD prevention, um, which is great, it's been pretty steady. We could always use more, we'd always love more time, um, and we could always use more resources for that. Um, in terms of, before I get to middle school, any other questions? Again, this was just a snapshot of high school, so we're gonna have more time to get into the other categories, but any questions about high school before I move forward? Okay. So middle school data collection is pretty similar, except there's 91 questions instead of the 123, so it's a smaller survey. Again, students can opt out. We tend to have a higher number of kids who choose not to participate at the middle school level, which makes sense from a developmental standpoint. Parents may choose to opt them out, or they themselves may choose to opt out. But if we look at the data pool, we have an 81% response rate, so pretty, pretty similar to the high school, which was 80%. If you look at the number of kids enrolled between the two middle schools, it's about 1,038 students. We analyzed 896 students who took the survey, 837 were included, and 59 were excluded for data cleaning. So pretty strong sample. And that's eighth grade, correct? Six no, through eight. Six. six through eighth, yeah. So the, the middle school sample across the different grades, you can see um, grade six, um, it's about 32%, no, sorry, 31%. So it is a little bit lower than the other two grades, but not that much. Um, and you can see that grade eight has the most participation. And then for gender, um, pretty, pretty even split. Um, the race is reflective of the demographics that we have in both middle schools. 
Um, and this goes back to um, the at least one trusted adult to talk to. This On this slide, you'll see both the school trusted adult as well as the community or family member. And you can see at the middle school level a nice jump, which is fabulous, of 74%. We're so proud of that <laughs> um, because I know the middle schools have worked so hard. Having the team-based model contributes to a lot of that, um, the work that both principals have been doing, as well as um, the individual activities and projects that they've been doing, which create more one-on-one -on -one time with teachers. And then if you look at the parent piece, really exciting to see 95% of kids feel like they can go to their parents or, or community member. I think that's amazing. Um, and that's a 10% jump from 2007, which is really great. In some communities, that number can be as low as 60%. So we take for granted that we're in the 80s, 90s, <laughs> but it is important to know that this is, it requires a lot of work on both parents' part and the school's part to get that number to where it is. So um, I know la last year at some points during the, um, our difficulties, difficult budget discussions, there were some references made to enrollment uh, being the same as it was you know, many years ago. And I think that th the key is these, this kind of result and the kinds of things that we're doing to connect with kids and support kids require a different set of programming resources and adults. And I think when we, you know, when we talk about the choices that we're, we're going to be making and have to make as a community, I think it's, it's, it's easy for us to, um, you know, sort of, you know, forget or lose sight of the resources and the impact that are involved in this. You know, we, we nearly um, had our, our team model at the middle school was in jeopardy this right, past bu right. budget cycle in a significant right. way, and it is in jeopardy going forward. And you won't get this, you won't have that support system. Uh, so without I, I, the team model, what we see, if you look at some of the data in, in other parts of the country, without the team model, those <coughs> rates tend to be below 50% for the trusted adult in the school. So I think that's really interesting that the, the team model really does contribute to this relationship building, which makes a ton of sense when you think about it, but the data does bear that out. So it is is important point to kind of keep in mind. The, the team-based model is something that, you know, when I went to junior high, which wasn't, wasn't even yeah, middle yeah, school, you know, right. it was a very different world. And so if you're parenting in this environment, team-based model may be something that's new for parents whose first child is coming up but it's really powerful in terms of the results that you see. Right, and, and we don't even have in our middle school the resources that we need to have around um, health and wellness and the programming. Right. And so if we, if we did have that, if we're able to maintain the team model and if we did have that, we could probably continue to make, make strides in that, which I think would be you know, really putting these kids on such a good, strong foundation getting into high school, right? And put them in a, be a better place in terms of handing all, handling all kinds of stressors, the, the ones that we just saw, you know, around schoolwork, around meeting the challenge of the schoolwork. Uh, so uh, we have some big decisions to make as a community, but these are outstanding, um, you know, uh, outstanding results and on the right track, and we need to decide if we're gonna keep doing that. Oh, it's also why I think last budget cycle, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Dory, we talked, we started talking about looking at things like a freshman academy to extend that team, you know, model mm -hmm. up for the high school, at least in the first grade, mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. Especially since we we've gone away from an advisory, uh, which is also you know a result of a budget reduction. So uh, you saw some of the earlier slides that talked about you know the stressors that high school kids are facing around academics and, and those are pieces that in some schools that have freshman academies or environments like that that help transition kids, you see it a little less. So. Mm -hmm. it, it was really powerful and, and Mike can attest to this when we were doing mental health first aid training, the biggest thing that we would see when we would talk about ability to connect with students and when in the day you could connect with students, high school teachers were always so jealous of the middle school teachers because they had team time and there was always this, well how do you do it and how does it fit into your day and well God I wish we had that at high school because there isn't that common time. You may be able to get with your department head or something like that, but there's nothing like it than what it is at the middle school. So there's definitely some envy there. So to yeah. be able to have something that's a little bit more focused, and I know freshman academies have been really uh, powerful in other, other districts, so it'll be great to see if, if there's some resources for that. I think it's Sorry. important to, I mean, I think the team model is important, but it didn't just ex come around yesterday. No, I mean, no. So there's other things that have gone into 
getting that 71 up to a 74 besides the team model. Right. And we've been we've doing that for right. at least 10 years, right? Well, well, Longer. Yeah. And one of the things we've seen in the last four years is the multi-tiered system of support, the MTSS model that we're, we've been talking about. And you definitely can see that reflected, um, not just in this data, but in other parts of the data set. Um, and you'll also notice that, and when I give you some of the results from our referral service project, um, to see how that affects um, the ability to notice if a young person is distressed and to get them to supportive services. Mm -hmm. Were there differences between the two middle schools in either of these measurements? No, interestingly enough. Um, so we do get separate reports for internal checking just to make sure from a data cleaning purpose. Pretty much within 0.5% almost every single question. Wow. So n not a lot of variation. And the sample for Coolidge is usually smaller because they have a smaller enrollment, but the data tends to look very, very similar. And we don't release that data, just so you know, by school, because um, we're actually restricted from doing that. For middle schools, you have to release it as a whole if you have more than one middle school. Um, so this brings us to our middle school stressors, you could say, you know, kind of what do they perceive as some of the stressors. Um, and you can see school demands and expectations is definitely the biggest chunk. Um, and then also having a busy schedule. Um, is definitely in there. And the busy schedule is both positive and challenging, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a good thing to stay busy, but then also it can create some crunch time the different parts of the year, different parts of the week, or the ability to get your family around the table for dinner. All that stuff is challenged by sometimes when things are happening in a given day. Um, you can see, though, that social pressure um, and other family personal issues tends to be much lower. Um, so I know that when we, we think about young people, we tend to think about the social pressure being the biggest thing, and that's definitely a thing. It's a big part of adolescence, but it's not everything. So there's a lot of other things that we actually do have some control over in terms of how we manage our day, how we manage the devices that are in our homes, all that kind of stuff. We can't control it all, um, but there are some boundaries and expectations we can place on, around some of it. Um, in terms of middle school sleep, um, so for 2017, 66% of middle schoolers got eight or more hours of sleep, which I think is amazing, because you saw the number <laughs> for the high school. Um, and it's, it's really powerful to think about only 24% at the high school level. They, they lose in half their sleep, basically, by the time they get up there. And I think it's just also the body clock changing as well, the older adolescents, um, and also they want to stay up later. So it's a challenge, but you can definitely see the big shift. Um, and there is more young people getting more sleep compared to 2015, which is great. Um, concussion for middle school. So about 7% said they had at least one concussion, 4% um, two concussions, um, three was 0%, and then four more concussions was 1%. Um, so the behavioral risk overview for the middle school, the only data that we have to compare the middle school um, for the national YRBS is available. The sample is much smaller than the high school sample. So we like to compare to the state sample because it's a little bit better for us in terms of looking at comparison. Um, but you can see that for um, past 12 months, felt sad or hopeless, that's the depressive indicator. Reading was 2000, for 2017 was 12% compared to the state rate. But again, the state rate we're comparing to is two years old. So it could be different. 16% um, at the state rate for the um, non-suicidal self-injury, um, and 12% for Reading, 11% seriously thought about suicide, and then 4% made a suicidal plan, and 4% attempted suicide. Of those that attempted suicide, only 1.5%, about 2%, required some kind of medical attention. Um, this is all the substances that we ask about at the middle school level. So you can see that cigarette use um, is relatively low, um, alcohol use is the highest out of all the substances, and marijuana um, is the second. Mm -hmm. um, we also ask the same questions about the prescription drug use without a doctor's order to get high. We ask about tranquilizers and stimulants and then all different types of prescription drugs, relatively low, um, 1 to 3 percent, and then in the past 30 days, less than 1 percent. Um, parental disapproval. The rates in middle school tend to be much higher um, because the research says that young people at that level actually um, feel the parental influences are a little bit stronger, uh, you know, earlier in their teens. Um, but you can see 98 to 97% for all four substances, which is really great. 
Um, and then for peer disapproval, they're actually pretty strong for peer disapproval, which mm -hmm. is really great. Uh, risk of harm, you can see the marijuana use, 55%, um, and the regular alcohol use um, is much lower. Um, and a little bit of chipping away at the, the RX drug use. So definitely uh, the risk of harm area where we haven't had a middle school health education program in place in the past few years, the risk of harm piece is definitely something that mm -hmm. does get communicated in health education. For middle school ATOD prevention, so alcohol, tobacco, other drug prevention, you can see that only about half feel like they're getting some. Um, it is an area that they're not able to do much up until this coming year, there'll be an expanded um, number of lessons, but since, I don't know how long it's been now, four years? Four years. Four yeah. years since we had the full program in place. So you can see the decline. Um, some added supports that we've um, been able to enhance by school level. Um, obviously the school policies, the health education classes in grades nine and 11. I apologize, this is a tiny little slide. I'll read it to you, only because I was trying to fit it all in. Um, ESPERT, which is relatively new for, for our district, ESPERT is screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. It's required by Mass State law that we do that as a school district. We piloted the program last year in grade nine through the nurse's office. She did an amazing job with the help of Adam's office. The secretaries were fabulous at helping to call the kids down. And um, 301 students were screened, and three were referred to uh, supportive services. So a very small number required additional services, but it was there. And this coming school year, we'll be doing grades nine and 11. So we're looking forward to that. Um, the chemical health and diversion programs that we have for any young person that does use a substance and get caught, we're able to provide education and referral to services. Um, then we have our youth mental health first aid training for adults to identify signs and symptoms, as well as interface. I'm <coughs> gonna talk a little bit about the results of interface in a few minutes. Our mobile crisis service, which I think Adam could probably attest to how what a valuable service that is. That's our state um, crisis mobilization service that we can call in to do an evaluation within the school setting, or a parent can have it done in their own home. Um, and it does, they do respond 24 seven. And then Safe Project Collaboration. Safe Project is a program <clears throat> through um, the Health Resources in Action Agency. They work with young people who are currently using substances and who don't wish to stop. The reason why that's important is not every young person is gonna come to you and say, I'm ready to stop. <laughs> so what the SAFE Project does is meet kids where they're at and help them limit their use and get to a point where they start setting goals to stop. Um, so it's a gradual program um, and they use an outreach-based approach. They'll meet a young person anywhere in Reading, meet them at the school, they'll meet them in their home, they'll meet them at Dunkin' Donuts, and they work with young people up to age 24. So it's definitely a resource that we've been promoting and Adam has met with the SAFE Project staff and our guidance is very familiar with them. We've had a couple cases go really well. So we've definitely been utilizing that more, I would say, in the last two years. Two years, yeah, last year in particular. And then at the middle school, obviously, the school policies, the team-based support. Um, this coming year, the expanded health education lessons that'll be coming, um, the same other three areas. And then at the elementary level, we have the benefit of open circle, yoga in the classroom, um, health education that's been going um, three years now, um, 12 lessons a year, um, and then interface as well as mobile crisis. So if we look at Interface, so um, Interface is new. Um, in November, we were able to secure a contract with William James College. They're formerly the Mass School of Professional Psychology. They run a clinician referral service where clinicians answer the phone and will connect a family member to um, appropriate mental health treatment for the insurance they have and the needs that they have. So what we've been able to do since we launched in like mid-November is connect 60 local families to services, which is amazing, really powerful stuff. Um, from November to June. And this is the breakdown of ages. Most were teens, so the high school has done a fabulous job of really pushing the service, letting parents know about it. Um, we've seen a huge um, increase in the elementary teachers using it, which is really fabulous, and the elementary school psych folks. And then you can see that some of the younger kids have benefited, as well as some of our older folks. We're hoping to expand more for our elders in the next year. We wanna make sure we get the word out because you can be any age and utilize the service. And then if you look at the presenting concerns, there's so many that it's hard to fit them on one slide, but these are the reasons why people call if for our particular 60 cases. So the most called for anxiety, depression, or a family-related concern, followed by ADHD, social issues, 
behavioral, bullying, stress, substance abuse, anger, um, parent coaching, divorce, chronic and disabling conditions, grief and loss, and obsessive compulsive disorders. <clears throat> Um, and then on the other side, the blue is really um, fewer calls for those, for those presenting concerns, but in one particular case, you could have five of those presenting concerns. So it's not just that you might call and say one. It could be, I'm going through a divorce, my child has anxiety, my younger child has a developmental delay, and I just lost my job. <laughs> you know, that's, that's uh, sometimes, you know, it's this really big storm of stuff that's happening, and that they're really fabulous at dealing with the complexity of those cases. So we're hoping in the next year to continue to expand the word around town that Interface is a free service for Reading residents and make sure that they know about this free service. Erica, is yes. it also for people who work in Reading or, oh no, Reading residents even if you're not in Reading, what's the? Um, for Reading public school staff, it hit, in the last year they were, we were allowed to use it for that purpose. We haven't renegotiated a contract for oh, next okay. year, so I can't speak to that quite yet. Okay. So you mentioned that. Uh, the interface uh, connects them with their uh, health insurance provider. So what happens if when you? So that's not free then. So it's, it's so so what the call is free and the service that the clinician provides over the phone is free. Once you get into treatment, then your insurance would be billed for whatever you're allowed to be billed for. But that's a question they ask at the beginning. Do you want to use your insurance? Do you know what your copays are? Can you afford your copays? And if not, then they also work with them to see if there's any copay assistance, and then also will help them with mass health if they have partial coverage or they're underinsured. So there's, you know, we also know like certain providers charge higher copays because they're out of network. So they also understand all of that and will say, you know, this provider might be more affordable for you, but this provider might be what you really want, you know. So they'll they kind of give you they give you three matches so that you have choices, and basically they t do a 15 minute intake on the phone with a family member. And then they call you back in a couple of days or a week with three matches based on the criteria that you asked for. Meets your insurance, is within this area, and then has a specialty with what you're looking for. So dealing with some of those presenting concerns. So what's helpful is I might call and I might need a child psychologist for my second grader who's having separation anxiety. And I'm a single parent. I have Blue Cross Blue Shield. Their behavioral health coverage might be great, might not be great. They know what that means when I say Blue Cross Blue Shield. As clinicians, they know, okay, the best way for this mom to get the most sessions <laughs> is to see this provider, which is information that mm -hmm. we can't keep up with because <laughs> it changes constantly. So they're really great at maximizing and they know what the limits are per year. They know what things that you need in terms of diagnostic criteria to keep getting the services that your family needs. So the, the, the word that we've gotten from people who've used the service has been really positive. And some of our surrounding communities also have it, Wakefield. Um, they've been going for th two and a half years. Um, in their first year, they had 80 cases. Last year, they had over 100. So each year, it's continued to grow. Woburn has it. Um, so we're, we are sending out information to local health care providers to let them know to also encourage folks to use it if they have folks from those communities. So that brings us to the end of part one. I know it was a lot of part one, uh, but hopefully that gives you just a little bit of a taste of kind of what we're seeing. I think that there's some, some pros and some cons and all of that, but it gives you a little bit of context as to where we are with youth risk behavior. Okay. Yes. Could you just make an announcement about September? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, our CASA, the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, is planning Recovery Month, which is a national activity that happens all across the United States to focus on celebrating people who are in recovery from substance abuse. It's also an opportunity to remember those that we've lost. Our CASA has an event almost every week in September. One of our big events is actually going to be happening at the high school. At Memorial Wall, we're going to be holding a candlelight vigil and a rally for recovery um, on September 20th. Uh, no, September 26th, 26th. 26th. And you'll, you'll get a flyer through John as we get a little bit closer. Um, there'll be six communities participating from the region. It's something that every year happens. Last couple years, it's been at Wakefield and Malden and Medford, and this is the year that Reading gets to host. So we're excited to be the host for that. We also have Dr. Pote coming. She's a fabulous speaker, a family physician, um, coming to our annual meeting at the end of the month in September. Then we're also presenting at Rotary, presenting um, with the Chamber of Commerce doing a business 
um, gathering to educate folks on substance abuse in the workplace. And then we also are gonna be working with our local churches on some activities. So stay tuned for lots of Recovery Month info. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Nice. Yes. Yeah, Erica, thank you. This is really good. But my question is actually just a follow up for Dr. Darty on this. So that what I'm wondering, if we could go back a couple slides to the sure. added supports. So for these supports, Dr. Gardy, I wanted to get a sense of what are the major resources that we're drawing on within our school system. So some of these we have our CASA as a volunteer organization. We have um, some outside res resources that have been highlighted, which is, which is terrific. And this Erica's presentation helps us see how they fit together. What I'm interested in is, you know, I think about the school transformation grant that we have, the PE, uh, FTEs that we support. Uh, what are the other kind of major, if you could just highlight two or three kind of major drivers of you know, at each level, so that as, as we're assessing kind of where resources are going, this is, this is an important part of what we use our FTEs and our budgets and our grants for. Um, is that something you could do tonight, just kind of off the top of your head, or is that I, something you'd want to come back to? Uh, most of this is what our, this is what our teachers do. Okay. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is your, um, this this is is your our average staff. classroom teacher. So this is all captured yeah. in FTE teacher most time. Of, most of what you see, it really comes from the teacher first noticing. That's really at all levels. You know, uh, the school psychologist might be the one to carry the ball forward, but really everything starts at the classroom level. And I don't know, Adam, would you attest to that? You know, there's some things that come to the administration's concern because of absenteeism or late, you know, being tardy and such, but most of it is coming from the classroom teachers. Is there training? Like, does the school transformation grant support The school transformation training? grant is providing the training to build the capacity of our staff. And that, that's always been the goal of the grant, because once the grant goes away, right. you know, you, you have to keep it sustainable. So a lot of the things that you see there are things that, or either from the school transformation grant or things that our CASA has done, or things that we have done internally without, you know, additional funding. Um, so for example, ESPERT is a state requirement. There's no funding that yeah. comes with that. Mm -hmm. That is the nurse's time. It's Adam's time. It's the secretary's time. It's my time that's being paid for through another grant. So it's, it's, it's really people. Um, there's not a lot of material cost. There's actually very low material cost with ESPERT. Um, but if you look at something like Interface Referral Service, that's $12,000 a year. That's currently being paid through a grant and a donation. In two years, we won't have that funding. And that's something that we'll, we'll have to think about in terms of resources. Um, SAFE Project is an outside service. Mobile Crisis is an outside service. Chemical Health and Diversion is really police resources combined with school resources. There's Health Educator FTE that's part of that. Um, health Education, which is our, our wellness teachers um, at all the levels. And then our clinical support staff, yeah. would you say? Yeah, I would just add that it's the bandwidth terms of the, your question is how many counselors, how many administrators, uh, how many folks are looking at the data, collaborating, talking with the caseload they have so that they're intervening, being proactive instead of reactive is really the, probably the most important piece of it all. And this doesn't capture the ongoing clinical needs that our, our social workers say at the high school manages or guidance manages in addition to what you see here and you saw in the presentation there's about 45 students that are hospitalized for mental health a year, maybe more than that at the high school. Yeah. Um, but they require transition plans when they come back in. They require sometimes therapeutic support services for a period of time. They may need special ed services. So there are other services that are dictated by needs that we can partially anticipate, but sometimes we don't know the level at, at which we will need them. So the bandwidth piece is, is really important at the special ed level as well as the clinical support. And the school transformation grant, can you remind us where we are in that? Like year what of what? Three of five, right? Okay. Very good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So that uh, brings us to our uh, liaison report section. As I previously mentioned, we're not. Uh, we're not, we're gonna get some more information before we do the uh, staffing request and we're not gonna cover everything in our, uh, do you have a liaison report? Um, I have a short one. Okay. Uh, and we're not gonna cover our, uh, 
all of our executive session material uh, until we have the full committee. So okay. I can introduce that. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, one of the things I wanted to provide an update on, but we have uh, Mr. Arena from the Board of Selectmen is since we've last met, there have been a couple Board of Selectmen meetings um, and on the 11th of July and the 25th of July, and there's some discussion about a survey. One of the public comments at the July 11th meeting was regarding um, opportunities to interact with the school around uh, developing a survey, and rather than, than summarize something that really isn't directly at this stage uh, part of, of the school committee, but I think is something where we're the school committee is going to work closely with uh, the Board of Selectmen and other parts of the community. Um, I just ask if John could give a, um, a brief summary of what that survey is and opportunities in the future that may be uh, available for the, the school committee to work with the Board of Selectmen if the chairman will yield that time. Can, can I just, I would just like to, before John speaks, I, um, you might not have been aware that the Mr. Robinson and I were trying to coordinate a meeting with Mr. Arena and Mr. Uh, Berman. Um, I believe it was, um, there was a finance committee meeting that we were all at where there was um, discussion about it and indication that we would try to uh, at least provide the school committee with some information. And then subsequent to that uh, selectmen's meeting, um, Mr. Arena and uh, Mr. Berman reached out. We were not able to coordinate our schedules and um, Subsequently, Mr. Berman and I met. Um, I, can, I can't recall. I have the date, but um, we met, and I was able to provide um, some feedback that Chuck and I had talked about. However, even at the prior selectmen's meeting, the, um, the 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 board, the motion, or the the board had stated that they would sort of uh, move forward once that discussion had occurred. So at that time, the selectmen, uh, we, we did not want to hold up that process. Um, and, and by saying it was going, we were gonna engage the full committee, and I don't believe that the selectmen wanted to do that. That was not the impression. So um, I was unable to attend the selectmen's meeting last week well, on Tuesday. Why don't we yeah. hear the read? Mm -hmm. Is that our kid? Does that pick you up? Do you, you, I'm sorry, John. <laughs> yeah, you may want to. Sorry. Most of the time, my voice carries, so. Okay. Um, on our meeting on the 25th, we entertained another round of review, found a couple of um, what I'll call language errors, cleaned them up, um, and finalized the version of the survey, which at this point is if it's not up, it should be up shortly. I think it's just being coded into SurveyMonkey. Um, we have a high expectation that the results and the response will be good. Um, my intention is to wait until we have a, a reasonable amount of data and then start to publish what we've got on a kind of rolling basis. And that most likely by, the, and this isn't, this is just opinion at this point, most likely by the end of September, I think its incremental value will have been, uh, its, its value will be, have been achieved and it'll probably be time to look at what our next round of survey questions would be. The first round is simply to an analyze for those individuals who either voted or didn't vote, what was their motivation? And secondly, in an environment like we have in 2017 and 18, looking at the, at the fiscal 19 budget, what, how, would you, how would you see the, your decision having changed? That's all we're trying to figure out is where were you then, where are you now, and what, what changed your mind? No more science than that. The, the survey is cross tab so if you said yes on one question, we can correlate that to <coughs> how you answered another part of the question. So, you don't have to deal with simple averages. You can start to look at groups within the survey. But in order to do that, you need a reasonable turnout. Um, so it's taken us a while. We'd hope to be in here by June. We're now entering August, but um, uh, hopefully by the end of September, we'll start to see meaningful data. My, my hope is to get several hundred type responses, which should be achievable, given the passion in the subject. Yeah. So was the, um, I didn't see, I know that the survey was not in the packet for the meeting on the 25th, but was it, has it been published? It was, I, I haven't, it was in it. the packet in the um, version that was handed out on the evening of the 12th. I don't know, I can't recall if it was in the electronic version that went out the prior Thursday. The 12th, Did, but it, I don't I'm think sorry, the 25th, the 25th. I don't, I don't believe that prior to the meeting, maybe just prior to the meeting. I, I, I guess I would like to, I haven't seen it, and given the discussion that Barry and I had, it would be good to, have just seen what the outcome was, whether any of the, um, the feedback was incorporated. I didn't know. That. I believe 
based on your conversation, there was an additional question that was added regards the use of town services. Mm -hmm. And most of our time was spent, how do we ask this question so that somebody seeing it for the first time can answer it correctly as opposed to those of us on the board who'd read the questions over and over again became blind to what the words were saying. But when you see it the very first time with, with new eyes, you say, what, what's the question you're really asking? So those are the kinds of clarifications and overall simplifications we made. But, but we did ask a question, ask an additional question based on your, your conversation. Okay. So is, when will that be available for us to see? Our direction, was, our direction last Tuesday night was to get it up as quickly as was possible. Uh, the skill for SurveyMonkey, um, it exists in the library, and uh, the library services offered to help code that and get it up and get it running. A version of that was up on our Tuesday night meeting. I didn't lay eyes on it, but I was told it was a version up just to evaluate the, the tool and make sure it worked. Um, and that was done, and that was successful. My expectation, if it's not up now, it should be up shortly. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Thanks for coming out here tonight. Hi, Jean. Um, hi. I have a question about um, duplicate surveys, both the electronic and paper. Is there a mechanism in place to ensure that somebody who has strong feelings one way or the other doesn't fill out the survey? Yes. The, um, as I understand it, um, SurveyMonkey re registers either the MAC address or the IP address that the survey comes from. And, and although it will accept two, you see them as two different entries, and you can call one or the other or both of them out if you choose to. So it saves the data, I believe. Okay. I may be proven wrong, but um, I'm told that that's the case. On the printed ones, I think at the uh, Pleasant Street Center, there's an attempt to do that in paper for folks that aren't comfortable with the PC. Sure. If folks want, there'll be a volunteer there to help do it during um, afternoon hours. But if they just want to do paper, that's fine, and we'll have staff uh, code it in during the day as if they had typed it in themselves. And one more. Are you going to be tracking paper versus electronic surveys differently? So could you look at them? You know, can you say, of the people who filled out a paper survey, this is the result, and of the people who did it That's online. an interesting thought. I hadn't thought of that. I just, I, there is a question about your age, your relative place in the, in the um, with regard to um, um, whether or not you have, you're using, you have children in the school. So there's a way for us to parse out folks where they are in their life cycle or where they are in their lives. But I hadn't thought about doing the paper one. That's an interesting question. We could certainly record that. So that would be people who, I'm sorry, Gene, no, that okay. weren't uh, comfortable using technology? Is right. That Primarily, yeah. yeah. Pleasant Street Center is the obvious one. And what's driving my thought, and I don't really sure. I don't know the details of how you're getting this out there, but it sounds like there's a reasonably safe mechanism for the online survey to keep from duplicates. Correct. But I, I wonder about the paper, depending on how that is, if there's a stack of them lying around. No, no, I don't believe so. I think I, they're under... You can go and request one. Yeah, you can't there's, grab a... You yeah. can't stuff the ballot there's box. There's a control no. <laughs> of someone there. All right. Thank, Thank you. So again, well, I think I think there'll be another effort to come up. I, I, we've got a bunch of other questions we want to get answers as well. And my guess is sometime in the September time frame, we'll start thinking about a second round of a survey that would put up sometime after that point. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. And then just to close off the point, I had noticed the discussion about the survey was, for me, was around two hours into the 725 meeting and about two hours, 40 minutes into the 711 meeting. So just to save people, if they want to go back and watch the discussion, I, I made some notes uh, so they know where to start. Thank you for coming and answering thank the questions. Thank you, Nick. Very helpful. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Gary, did you have any no, reports? I will be on the uh, Alcasa. So nothing yet. Yes? Nothing further. Elaine? No. Nope. Yes, Jean. The Recreation Department and Recreation Committee are ecstatic to announce that the Hunt Playground is up and functional, um, and it is really, oh. really fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did they move out the left field fence yet? <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. Uh, Mr. Martin, do you have any? Gail. I only have the audit end of year audit report that I can either do now or. We can do that in reports, right? Sure, absolutely you can. So in the packet is a copy of the FY16 end of year audit report. So this is 
a year ago, not the most recent one. Mm -hmm. um, just a little background, I'm sure you probably have gone through this, but on an annual basis, we're required to support, to provide to the Department of Education and end of year report, which is a culmination of all of the school spending, which includes not only the school direct spending but also allocations from the town as well. So, any expenses related to the school that are ca um, captured under the town finances are also part of this process. So, we work very closely with the town accountant to gather all of the various information. It also includes any capital projects as well related to the school. DESI utilizes this information for a lot of reasons. The most obvious one is they utilize this to calculate the net school spending to ensure that each community is in compliance with the required net school spending. So that's the main reason that they utilize it. Also, the various information that you see on their website that we also use throughout the budget process <coughs> comes from the end of year report. So a lot of the various categories that we report on are the results of the end of year report. Since the information is on their website and it is also utilized for the net school spending, we're required to have an independent audit report done each year where the um, auditors from Melanson and Heath come in and review all of it and then they report any of their findings, which the majority of them are either items where we have classified in one line item that based upon their review and our discussion we might need to move items around also is depending upon when the report is filed and the audit has occurred, if there are any changes to budgetary figures, you also need to continuously update them. So if we've had another town meeting or items have changed mm -hmm. before the audit report's issued, um, we need to go in and update any budgetary figures. So that'll be something we'll be doing this year as we go through it. Um, so the findings that they had, we actually the town accountant and I sat down with the auditors and walked through each of them to understand how they came across them, what the findings were, and we actually filed amendments to address all of the items. Some of the areas that they're working on is that they're really looking at any district-wide expenses that we have in there to the extent you can actually allocate them down to specific schools. So historically, our data coaches, our team cheers, we've always considered those district-wide expenses because they support the entire district. But we now are going in, and this was new this year, that basically Desi came out and said, we really want everything mm -hmm. pushed down to a school level. So now we're looking at it. So each team chair, if they're across multiple schools, we allocate their time. The same with the data coaches. We look to see, on average, how do they spend their time. So we took the 2016 and allocated those down to the schools. And then going forward, we'll be looking to budget them and put the actuals based upon those allocations so that it'll automatically be where it needs to go. Um, <clears throat> and then we also looked at how we allocate certain items from the town levels. Historically, we've the budget and the actuals have been pretty close, so we've always relied on what we budgeted, but then to the extent if there are significant changes, we now have a new process in place to say, okay, did we add services, did we add staffing, so that we'll revisit how we're doing budget actu allocations versus actual allocations. Um, so overall, a very good report, and then if they have minor issues, they'll let us know, and those are usually items that might be $1,000 here or there that they think might you could look into. We looked at those, um, and none of them were significant, so we did not make adjustments for some of the minor items that they noted, but um, the first five items we did adjust the report and push the amendments through so that the data will reflect it once they push the live data to the website. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I just I wanted to ask about the calendar. So this is uh, fiscal 16, which ended at the end of June. Yes. And my memory is you joined us in August. Yes. So I just the very end of August. Yeah. Yes. So um, so you did this. This is sort of like the first thing. This was you the first did. thing I did when I started. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to get the calendar straight. And I have a follow-up. <laughs> <Day> one. Yes. <laughs> follow-up question. 
Um, you mentioned that DESE would like us to take costs that we historically kept at the district wide and push them down. And so you said moving forward you're going to do that. How labor intensive is that versus how you do it now? It is more labor intensive um, because people can move throughout the year and each year your allocations could change depending upon need. So you could, depending, team chairs might be a good example. Yeah. Carolyn can't kick me if I speak out of tune. So you may have instances in which in a particular year you have a team chair at a school. So I set that person up. And then the following year it may be the same team chair who's supporting a different school. Or a team chair who is splitting between two schools. Or I'm part out of district, I'm part. So it is more time consuming. So the goal is to revisit at the beginning of each year. Mm -hmm. and then say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We'll try to draw a line in the sand, set all the people up correctly in payroll to allocate their salaries between the various schools, and then keep it that way for the entire year unless something significant has happened during the year. Um, the same with any of the data coaches if um, – probably a – so in the 2016, we had the math and – Literacy. Literacy. So it was a matter of saying, okay, did they truly support all seven so I can allocate it based on headcount? Or did they mainly focus on elementary, which I then look at the elementary and say I have to look at enrollment and allocate it based upon student enrollment as opposed to just saying five elementary, 20%. So it is it's and easier to have it district-wide, but I, the, I understand the purpose of it, so it's a matter of trying to get it as directionally correct as you can. And that sounds very manual. It and is 100% manual. Okay. Yes. Just, if you're looking yeah, at Munis can't more, do that. Munis can't <laughs> do that. So we actually have to go in and I have to take Craig Martin and say, oh, you're 17% at Killam, you're 20% at Eaton, and I have to create an allocation within Munis that would do it. And if halfway through the year we say, ooh, he's no longer doing that, I have to go in and change his allocation going forward. And you're doing that for every position? Every that, was, that was district wide. <coughs> yes. District every district wide position? District-wide, that is student-oriented. Student -oriented. So, okay, yep. Administration, no, because we are not directly in a classroom, but anything that is, so ELL, yep. the ELL. coaches, the but team chairs. Our elementary technology integration elementary spaces. Technology so, yeah. right, any of, the, any of our resources that are directly related to students that are split, more than one, that school. More than one school, yeah which is um, a lot. It is a decent number. That right. That's one of any the Any of the specialist type positions that support mm -hmm. more than one. So what's the purpose of all of this? The purpose Other of than it, job creation for it, somebody. It's in job security at, no. Like, State um, house. Yeah. Part of the, under my understanding is there eventually, which hasn't fully been vetted yet is currently now you have a, your per pupil calculation that is driven off of the end of year report. One of the long term goals of DESE is to do per pupil spending by building. By building, yeah. So that you can say, here's your total, and Killam, Birch, the high school, Coolidge, here is the per pupil per building is ultimately where they would like to go. So they're trying to get as many district-wide expenses at the school <coughs> level. <coughs> Whether yes. or not they'll actually ever get there, I don't know. I think I just have <coughs> one more question. So having gone through the audit, the, the experience for the first time, can you, and you sort of spoke to this, but what did you take away that you thought, boy, this is something I'm gonna do differently going forward or? or A lot of it is the preparation I now going forward for this year making sure from the budgetary standpoint and where items are going to get them set up because my view is it's easier if you fix it going in than trying to fix it coming out on the, the back end I think the other part too is um, the town accountant and I it was a great experience for the both of us to say okay this is we actually have to do much more of the but anytime there's a budget amendment anytime there's an item like that. So if additional funding gets approved at whether it's the November or the April, get those amendments. Go in and 
make the adjustments. make the adjustments ahead of time so we can go ahead and do a lot of those and I think a lot of it too was how do we look at and assess the expenses allocated from the town to make sure we're utilizing the right methodology and we're tracking that if the other part that was beneficial for me as well is a lot of the capital projects mm -hmm. having come in when I did I it was sort of after the year had finished is the distinction between capital projects that are funded via debt versus operating non-debt because there are different ways you categorize the items if they're bonded or not so it's also being okay now I go through all the warrants and note them to say this is how the projects are funded because if it's funded through a bond you're going to eventually pay that down over time so you don't want to put it all in in year one because then you'll double count it when you start paying down the debt so it was very informational that way to say okay this is these are the little nuances that that are in there so I think a lot of it will be able to much more upfront have the information so that when I go to do it <laughs> next month <laughs> I'll, I'll have a lot of the information saying, okay, these are the items that we need to make sure we we look out for. Thank you. Can I just? Yes. Well, um, so when you said you would sort of set those allocations at the beginning of the year, does that really mean August, or does that mean like you really don't have a good feel for that till um, a no, little bit later? Or have what? a good feel for that mainly until September because to mm -hmm. the extent we're hiring any of the positions right now, it's a matter of, okay, we have this group here how are they allocated and then if we have any other open positions once they come in does it sort of reshuffle the deck and the other part too is because we also report on the grants that way as well so one of the larger grants we have the IDEA grant we have teen chairs as well as teachers on there so I need to make sure and they get allocated to the grant so I actually can't fix them in Munis going in because they get charged to the grant, they don't get charged to the operating budget, so I have to manually offline track everybody who's on a grant and what school they're supporting and then manually allocate them as part of this process. So for each of the grants where we have folks that are supporting the schools, I have to go in after the fact and allocate it all out. So a lot of it now is creating the spreadsheets to say these are the people here's the schools they're in and here's how I need to allocate them it sounds like a tremendous amount of work and it and I, I'm concerned that it's you know you it's lining up for September which there just won't be enough um, hours in the day and you know then we we go and we're gonna be starting pretty much That's right away the budgets budgets um, and uh, you know, it was such an intense year last year, and I think it's only going to be more intense this year. So I'm just really concerned about the resources that we have to do this job. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Darty. Yeah, I have I have several items. Um, but first, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have Mr. Martin answer a question that was brought up. Um, w there was a question brought up in the last school committee meeting about. A particular slide that was connected to um, uh, my evaluation and um, I know that Mr. Boyman had asked to for us to explain the slide so I'm gonna have Mr. Martin explain the slide the slide was uh, had come from um, the, a presentation I did to the school committee I believe it was in January uh, when I came back from the visit to the White House from the White House um, and so the slide that I had showed was a slide <coughs> focused uh, from a certain report called the Appleseed Report. So I'm going to have Mr. Martin explain that slide. Yeah, so, uh, when Dr. Doherty asked me to sort of provide some context or explanation about where the state is coming from and why it's Wait, important I'm to us. Do we have a copy of this slide? I'm sorry. No, I do have copies over here. Okay. I have copies of it. Here I can pass. I have a copy in front of me. You can pass around. I have, I have copies. Oh, you do have copies. Good. I thought I'd start sort of broad first in that um, why it's important to us as educators and why also I think our state is putting a focus on this type of data though in the last few years you know as educators especially who are working with children from many different backgrounds and experiences we always realize that 
possessing skills and understandings of cultural proficiency, um, truly understanding our students' backgrounds. It's an important part of our profession, especially, I think, because it's very easy for incorrect assumptions or biases to sort of creep into our practices or our decision-making, um, even with the best intentions. Um, and so I've always thought just as human beings, I'm not sure we could ever get rid of our ignorance or biases until we first acknowledge that we could have them. Um, and are we as an organization asking the right questions, raising the right issues to examine closely? And so this specific data that was presented on a slide um, regarding race is from 2014-2015 school year. And it's part of our state effort to help educators examine these important issues of access and equity among all students. Um, it was compiled from district information for all districts across the state um, by the Massachusetts, and it says there on the, on the handout, from the Massachusetts Appleseed Center for Law and Justice, which is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote equal rights and opportunities for Massachusetts residents. Um, the center is independent and nonpartisan, and basically they thoroughly research any issues which may prevent equal treatment for all. Um, it's actually a nonprofit, part of a nonprofit network of 17 public interest centers um, across the country that work both independently and collectively on these types of issues. And clearly student discipline and how it is determined um, could potentially play out in this, in this way. Um, as I was aware that one of the committee members evaluation document referenced this data in connection with the high needs student subgroup, I do feel it's important to clarify that um, it would be not accurate to make a connection between any race subgroup and the high need and what the mm -hmm. state refers to as the high need subgroup. So to clarify, the high need subgroup, as the state determines it, is comprised of students belonging to at least one of the following individual subgroups. Students with disabilities, English language learners, or former English language learning students, or economically disadvantaged students. So race, obviously, is not one of those identifying um, factors. I also thought, I mean, it's somewhat tan tangential, but I thought it might be a good time also because I do sometimes hear some of this confusion um, as our Boston students who are part of the METCO program are sometimes referenced incorrectly as a subgroup. Um, I thought it might be important to note that they do not fall into any one subgroup and do not constitute a subgroup as METCO students um, alone. For instance, not all, not all, but many of our Boston students are African American. But when looking at our district's race or ethnicity data for student enrollment, um, I think it's also important to point out that about a third, I actually think it's closer now to about 40% of our African American students in our district are local Reading students. Um, nonetheless, when we received this report in 2014 and 2015 um, from the Appleseed organization, or the state published it for all the different districts, um, and you can see that what it's doing here is if the, the gap, the differential, in the discipline rate, um, especially between the black or Latino and white rate is greater than 10%, they were identifying those districts or those schools where it was an issue. Um, we realized right away that we, we had already sort of begun this process, but this really brought it home to us, that we needed to figure this out. And to really do so accurately, we needed to drill down better in terms of the specifics. Um, starting then that school year, certainly the following school year, as you may know, um, we started using the Swiss, which is a web-based application to track student discipline. Um, we realized that first we needed to have a consistent process in place and consistent definitions for um, any sort of student discipline or what, what was defined as a particular, how a particular infraction was defined at a particular school or at a particular level. Mm -hmm. um, so that we could really look at this data across all of, this, all of the schools. Um, since that time, then, Swiss has given us the ability to look at things. I have some notes here. For example, patterns um, of discipline by time during, during the school day, time, location, day of the week, behavior that might have led to a discipline in, um, incident, 
um, grade level, student, various demographic filters, um, and student status issues, all of that sort of stuff. Um, it also gives our teams the opportunities to ask questions about the students' practices and even ourselves because you know we can ask such questions as who's involved, what's the behavior being disciplined, are there any patterns that we're seeing um, in a particular grade level, gender, race, staff member even, um, schools, are there any other risk indices by race, ethnicity, SPED status, um, is that coming into play? Do we see any patterns or trends in there? Essentially, why is it happening? I mean, I feel in, in issues of data like this, it's really, <coughs> before we can get to the answers, it's simply first, let's ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. um, so exploring these questions help us define and discover really the root cause. What resources are we perhaps underutilizing? Are there other resources we need to be using or looking at? Um, are there practices that need to change? Um, are there trainings or things that we need to undertake as a staff? What practices are working well and, and so forth? Um, and so that's in the, uh, you know, I didn't want to talk about, you know, the entire report. I mean, I think it's online. There are many districts. Um, I could mention other districts besides our own that were listed. I didn't want to do that, to be really honest, because I didn't want to minimize the fact that this is not not something that we should feel good about if there's a difference. Mm -hmm. um, I think that things are getting better in this, um, but uh, I'm not proud of that. I am proud, though, that in the last few years that our staff is embracing this and looking at this very closely, um, and that we have put practices in place to ask the right questions and to examine this. Um, and so that sort of provides some context about where this data <coughs> comes from. Um, and I know, you know, even in some of the grants that we've applied for and so forth, this question about cultural proficiency that I mentioned at the beginning, that's being asked more. You know, I just completed our mentoring and induction report for the state, and one of the questions that they ask is, you know, are you providing um, any sort of training or supports for new staff coming in around cultural proficiency? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's sometimes easy for communities like Reading and many others that aren't as diverse as some to think it's not as much of an issue, but it is. It might play out in smaller ways, but it's definitely there. So that's the context for this data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to tie in a couple of things similar to uh, that, that, that are connected to my, to my report that have been going on in the last six weeks since we've last met. Um, I did... Uh, I've met a couple of times, and it, this is connected to the um, to the graffiti incidents that uh, we had in May and um, June. So after after school ended, um, I met a few times with Rabbi Abramson from the um, Burlington Temple, and uh, we talked a little bit about how she addressed a situation in Bedford four years earlier, and we had some good conversation about that. She, um, she mentioned some things that they had done early on in the process to create a community-wide effort to, to address um, this type of graffiti and, and behavior. Um, result of that, I also had some conversations with the Bedford superintendent on the role that he played in that four years ago. There's actually a Boston Globe article on it. Um, from 2015 and how the community addressed it. They talked early on, he talked early on that they had a um, community session with the Jewish community, um, which included the police chief and the school superintendent to just do a lot of listening with the Jewish community on what the concerns were. So um, in late June, I think it was the 27th of June, um, we, uh, we had a, a neighborhood community session at um, the Rubens home, um, and that was that there was about 40 people from the Jewish community attended that session. And uh, my, uh, Chief Sagala was on vacation, but um, Deputy Chief Clark joined me, and we had a very good conversation and listening session as to um, the concerns that we heard, um, what this graffiti actually meant to them, 
um, and some of the things that they have experienced um, in the community, but also uh, in the schools. And so, and these are, these are parents that currently have children in the Reading Public Schools. These are parents that have had children in the Reading Public Schools. Um, there were actually a few students that attended that evening um, and gave feedback as well. Um, so it was, it was a really good educational session, which I walked away learning a lot on some of the things that we can do differently. Since then, a couple of other things we've been doing. Um, we've arranged for some training that's going to be coming up uh, at the end of August with all of our administrators with the Anti-Defamation League. And we're going to make that a day-long training. It's going to focus on um, anti-bias and bullying and um, what they refer to as the isms um, in our society and how we as administrators um, can create a, a safe environment and address those situations appropriately. Um, in addition to that, uh, something that I did mention that was going to be doing uh, this summer is I have arranged a group um, that is looking at the religious accommodation policy. Um, we've had one session. We're having another session tomorrow. Uh, my hope is to bring forward to you at our August meeting a uh, recommended revisions to the pol current policy that we'll, you can have a first reading at and then have a second reading in early September. Um, in time for um, the, the different religious holidays that will begin in, in mid to late September. Uh, so those are, those are a couple of the things that we've been working on. We're, we're also working on, um, I'm updating the uh, bullying prevention plan, uh, which we, we update every couple of years, which I'll be hopefully also be giving to the committee either in August or in early September as to some of the things that we're going to be doing this year um, as well. And some of the things that um, I heard from the listening session and some of the other things that we're going to be doing are Im embedded in that report. So over the last six weeks, we have done a lot of listening and a lot of planning and moving forward in how we're going to start addressing some of the concerns that, that have been brought up um, in our in our. Uh, school community. So I wanted to update the, the committee on that. Can I just add one thing yep. just to clarify when I said what I felt good about or what because I didn't I really don't want to try to wasn't trying to paint a rosier picture but having lived and worked in writing a long time what I what I think is something that that the level of transparency I think is a, a great thing about our community um, and sometimes connecting with other districts these sorts of things um, they're not always readily available. They're not a part of a district or school report card and so forth. And so I think, you know, it's what I said at the beginning, you can't address an issue until you first recognize very transparently and publicly that there is one. And so the fact that this appears on slides and people are aware of it and we are absolutely committed to addressing it and began several years ago, that part I think is a good thing and that should be a model for all districts. Have a couple of other um, so in your packet, there is a school improvement plan summary for each of our, our buildings. Um, what we, we did this year, and we're going to continue to do this moving forward, is each building principal um, is giving a, a summary of what they have done in relation to their school improvement plan. It's, it's not in there? No, sorry. No, they are. Oh, it's in there. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, what each building principal and their school has done in relation to the school improvement plan so that you have a snapshot at the end of the year as to what has been accomplished. Um, so I hope you find that helpful. It's already on our website. It's on the district page um, under district information. Um, also, uh, as what now is part of our regular packet, you have some email correspondence, uh, which is listed in the agenda. Um, do you want to give you an enrollment update, uh, particularly? So I want to pass that out. While that's being passed out, um, last week I, I did my midsummer 
four with uh, Mr. Huggins, Joe Huggins. Uh, we went to each building to see what the progress was of, of the different repairs and cleaning. Um, we're, we're right on track as to um, making sure that, that all of the different uh, orders that were uh, building orders and um, cleaning is being done. Uh, and so, so we're in pretty good shape there. Uh, I'll do a similar tour with Mr. Huggins um, about the third week in August. Um, but you know we're we're in good shape. We're we're rolling along, and our and our buildings are looking better and better each day. And that's due to the hard work of our custodial and maintenance staff. So the enrollment that you see here, um, the elementary is on one side, and then the entire district. You have a snapshot on the on the other side. Um, you can see elementary wise, for the most part, we're in fairly good shape. Um, there's a couple of spots. Uh, the Barrows Kindergarten um, is a little high, as you can see there. Um, we in second grade. Um, it's a little high, but for the most part, everything else is in is in very very good shape, as you can see from our from our enrollment. Um, if you flip it on to the other side, the biggest area of concern I have, which um, we've talked about before is the Coolidge sixth grade where the class sizes are were around 29 um, that's where you see the one the 174 in grade six uh, it, it really has to do with an anomaly of a re, of the redistricting it's not due to a budget reduction or or anything like that um, every once in a while we do have a bubble go through a particular school the class sizes are are High, higher than um, than than normal, and this this is definitely a case. It's something we've got to keep an eye on. But I think overall our enrollment is is in, in our class sizes are in good shape, and we'll continue to monitor it. I mean, we still have another month to go, but the rush is usually over by now, I and mean, we will get a few at the just before school starts. But um, you know, we're we're in pretty good shape. How does that uh, Parker eighth grade compare to the class that just graduated? Wasn't that a big class too? The Parker eighth grade? Yeah, you, it's up one seventy three. Um, the Parker. That, you mean the current, the ninth grader is now going into no, the high school? No, the. Well, I guess that would be the eighth graders, right? Isn't that what that this is? This is the current eighth. Uh, yeah, this this upcoming that eighth grade. It seems high. It, uh, well, don't forget, that's that's divided by eight. For Parker, that's actually pretty low. Yeah, yeah. It, Coolidge is divided by six, and Parker is divided by eight. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Because uh, Parker is a, is a little bit bigger school. They tend to be closer to 200. Yeah. Right. I believe that's that's it. That's all I've got. Yes, Nick. I did question if someone in the public wanted to get either of these handouts that we had just now during the updates, how would they go about doing that? So we had this update this here. Yeah, or 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 the first one that we um, discussed with Mr. Martin. Mrs. Engelson can uh, repost the entire packet and put these two documents in there, which is what she normally does. Great, thank you. Motion to adjourn. No. Uh, no, we have. Um, we have to go into executive session. Uh, we are going to go into executive session to protect the uh, bargaining position of the board, not to return to open session. Uh, yep, yeah, move to enter into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining. And the approval of minutes not return not to return to open session. Second. Yes. 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 Yep. Yes. Thank you.